Greetings, folks. Another episode of New Moon's Getaway. Life examined by an aspiring 21st century Maroon. In the southern United States, where slavery became the basis of the agricultural economy, race came to serve as an organizing social principle. Again, just to go a little further into again, that particular idea, that, that this concept, I want to just read briefly some of what Dr. Badalora had to say about this development. So again, she, she has written, she's written this book, oh, Birth of a White Nation, Examine all, examining these things ends up attacking one, one sense of self. You think of yourself as being one thing, and then you find out actually it, you're, you're something actually very different. And that's actually quite unsettling. So, um, but I think it's, it's, it deserves a very, very close considered examination. Very important to, you know, to unpack. Basically, you know, you're born into, you, I mean, we're largely born into a world that is not explained to us very well. I mean, I think that's, and, it, and there's, a, there's a reason for that. I mean, it, it, the world as it is constructed works very well for some people and not so well for others. So if it doesn't really serve one's purposes to explain why things are the way they are, then you're not going to go out of your way to volunteer information that doesn't serve you. Dr. Battalore apparently used to be a, a, a cop in Chicago and, um, and then later on went on to become an academic. So I think it's very interesting. It's a very interesting combination, you know, in terms of the, the, her, experience, her experience as a cop in Chicago, which again, I think it's even more, more interesting. And then to see how that has, inf how that has informed her scholarship. Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's particularly um, noteworthy. So she says, so again, just to read part of this piece, to, to Jacqueline Battalore, a white, uh, white people are an invention. She clarified, designating, designating a group of light-skinned people as white, quote-unquote, Battalora said, only started less than 350 years ago, and the separation of people by race only dates back to the 17th century. Racial problems, Battalora said, started in the United States after the government passed anti-miscegenation laws, which said white people could not marry non-white people. So it's just very interesting to see where, again, this thinking begins, at least in, in, the, uh, in reference to the United States. And again, some of you guys you know, might already be familiar with this, but for those who aren't, this, again, this is, this is very important to understand where these ideas come from. Battalora said her book focuses on the beginning of labeling white people as a distinct group and how the label has caused racial and social problems like segregation and discrimination in the United States. This was the first time white referenced a group of humanity. And a government doesn't label a group of people for no reason. So Battalore began her lecture by talking about colonial American when all free men had the same opportunities as a matter of law. African men could vote, and they did. They could own slaves, and they did. They could marry someone of, of the opposite sex, and they did. Battalore explained the idea of whiteness, quote-unquote, was built off the British idea that you must be Christian and freeborn to deserve rights and privileges that the government can deny others. The idea was not wholly popular at the time, but it eventually led to strict laws. In, 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 seven, in 1676, colonists rebelled as part of Virginia colonist uh, Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion and posed a threat to capitalism. So this is the famous Bacon's Rebellion. After the rebellion, English Parliament issued new laws that included prohibiting blacks from holding office, marrying whites, possessing weapons, and testifying against whites. The government now required that employers pay whites in goods, including gun, uh, in, uh, guns and powder, after completing a term of service. Battalora said these new laws did very little to improve the economic status of these new white people, but it, but it tossed native tribes and people of African descent to the bottom. The laws linked all white people, even those who were common laborers, a connection that still occurs today in the context of top 1%, and the 99% of income earners. Today, many white people feel more connected to Paris Hilton than their African-American neighbors, or people, of, again, of similar um, economic status. So the first appearance of white, quote-unquote, as a label was in 1681, Battalora said. Under anti-miscegenation laws, colonial America prohibited marriage between a white person and a non-white person. As a legal category, and then what, creating this as a legal category, what it facilitated, or what it permitted was essentially you've now got a group who can now be made into a permanent a permanent class of of uh, or a permanent group of bonded labor. This permanent group of bonded labor is basically your energy your energy source, which fuels your economy. 
And again, this has been this has been broken down pretty thoroughly. So I mentioned in the in the last episode, Edward Baptiste's book, uh, The Half Never Told, about how uh, slavery served as the basis for um, the creation of American capitalism, um, because it was not only a matter of this group of bonded labor being simply an energy source; they were also um, a securitized asset. Right. So these were these were things like livestock that could be. Um, that would be insured, right? That um, you could actually borrow against. They were a way of being able of you being able to get access to other financial capital. And then they then they because they were essentially a product that had to be managed. It also enabled um, uh, other ways to be able to generate economic activity. So obviously somebody had to manage them. Someone had to uh, provide security against them because there was a, of course there's a a major problem with. Um, slaves um, rebelling um, uh, and, and, and pos possibly escaping and then eventually doing things like destroying property or uh, killing, killing their, uh, their handlers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very expensive business, um, a very dangerous business, and it was a way for people to be able to establish and create business for themselves, just like having to, dis to, to defend against the native population um, was a way of being able to uh, create business. So this is one of the big reasons why weapons, um, why guns figure uh, so prominently into, um, into th the history of America and the culture of America is that it, it necessitated using a lot of violence to establish these systems. So again, this is just trying to look at this as objectively as possible is functionally speaking what 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 does the, the these these types of things uh, what does it facilitate what is it what does it permit to happen so it's not this is not random it's not you know it's not simply a matter of one group of people not liking another group of people or one group of people just not being nice to another group of people functionally what does this allow what does this permit what does this bring into being so again, it's very important to you know to understand the the purpose of uh, doing these things. Uh, so continuing, he says slavery ended in the U.S. in 1865 due to resi resistance on the part of slaves and ex-slaves. Campaigns of persuasion by abolitionists and a bloody civil war that entailed up to 750,000 deaths. I mean, the, previously you'll see cited often uh, somewhere on the order of about a hundred thousand less deaths, but this has over the years been, been increased um, to where now, again, the figure is three quarters of a million people dying in the Civil War, American Civil War. Again, out of a total population of 34 million. It's a pretty amazing number, because so right now, if we look at the, the current population in, in the United States, which is uh, approximately 340 million, uh, actually, you know, it's probably close to 330 million, but it's roughly 10 times. Um, that would be upwards of seven to seven and a half million people dying in the, in the American Civil War, the equivalent, the current equivalent. So that's a lot of folks. Very, very destructive. But racism continued and does to this day, not just in the American South, but throughout the nation and internationally as well. And, I, and again, just to, to make sure that we understand that this was not only, um, again, what the war was fought over was not only a, uh, the product of uh, this institution that was practiced in the South. The North was involved in this as well. So again, um, another book worth, worth mentioning, again, for those who are not again, familiar with this history, uh, there's another book called Complicity, How the North Promoted, Prolonged, and Profited from Slavery by Ann Farrell, Joel Lang, Jennifer Frank, and Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Um, some other books worth looking up. The American Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry by Ned and Constance uh, Sublet. Uh, then there's Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II by Douglas Blackman. Um, there's some other titles here. But the, you know, the importance of those books is this understanding that, that this was an industry. And I think I'd mentioned in the previous um, uh, the previous episode that at the at the start of the Civil War, slaves were 
they were the most valuable asset class in the American economy. They were worth more than all of the other asset classes combined, and this has been discussed in a number of different places. Uh, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, I think, has also mentioned this point um, in his writings as well. Um, in particular, I think that the article, the long article he wrote for The Atlantic, uh, The Case for Reparations.